All right, well, the text we're looking at this morning is, is brief, uh, but it actually has a message in it that I didn't uh, want to, to connect to the last message, is simply an addendum, because I think there's something very important that's going on here. So let's uh, read the text, and uh, the, the theme I want us to look at is that essentially through what happens here, the Lord allows um, a door to remain open for the gospel in Philippi, and that is the most important thing. So beginning in verse 35 through verse 40, we read this. Now when the day came, the chief magistrates sent their policemen saying, release those men. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the chief magistrates have sent to release you. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us in public without trial. Men who are Romans and have thrown us into prison. And now are they sending us away secretly? No, indeed. But let them come themselves and bring us out. The policemen reported these words to the chief magistrates. They were afraid when they heard that they were Romans, and they came and appealed to them. And when they had brought them out, they kept begging them to leave the city. They went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia, and when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. Well, may the Lord bless His word to our understanding and to our edification this morning. Now, we saw two weeks ago that the owners of the woman that Paul had delivered dragged him and Silas before the city magistrates. The magistrates proceeded to order their robes removed uh, for them to be publicly beaten and thrown into prison and all without trial. Now we noted then Paul's and Paul and Silas's willingness to, to go through with, with this. Uh, they, they didn't, you know, there basically didn't appear to be anything, particularly in Paul's case, that he wasn't willing to do for his Lord. And we know uh, that that is the attitude that our Lord also wants within us. But this is something that we're not really going to have until we are willing to pay the price they were willing to pay. And that is, of course, the ultimate price. Until we're willing to die, we're not going to be able to serve the Lord in the way that they served him. And again, I'll just remind you, that is what Jesus means. When he says we must be willing to take up our cross, if we are to follow after him, we must be willing to lay down our lives because that's the only way we can serve him in the way he calls us to serve him. Because obviously in a situation like that, the one they were living in, that meant that your life would be in danger. You must be willing to risk that. Now last week, we, we saw at least one of the reasons why the Lord allowed that arrest to take place. It's because there were some he wanted to reach in sort of an out-of-the-way place, sheep, that he had promised to his son, and that was the Philippian jailer and his family. That's why he sent Paul and Silas into the jail. I mean, it was the Lord who did that. That was his plan. Why he sent the earthquake to open the cells and to loosen the chains why he prevented the prisoners from escaping after he released him. Remember, that was the thing that probably got the jailer's attention. More than just about anything else was the fact that they didn't run away when they were freed. He wanted to get the jailer's attention to open him up to hearing the gospel that he might bring both him and his family to himself. Now again, the Lord wants to use us, and, you know, there's certain things that have to be true of us. We, we have to be willing to die, to give up our lives. We have to be willing to do things, of course, uh, His way, but we also need to look for His providential leading. You know, the Lord opens doors for us, and be willing to walk through those doors when He opens them with His courage. Now, this morning, I want us to see that he had at least one last purpose in this arrest, and that is he wanted to keep the door to the gospel open in Philippi, and this actually did a very good job of keeping that door open. So, let's take a look at this passage. Now, Luke tells us 
that on the next day, and it appears that Paul and Silas were only in prison for one day, for one, one night, as it were. The next day, the magistrates sent their policemen to the jail with orders to release Paul and Silas. Okay? Either their punishment was enough, uh, the term had been, had been served, or it's possible that these magistrates may have made a connection between the earthquake that had taken place that evening before and what they had done to Paul and Silas. Let's not forget the Romans were a very superstitious group of people. I mean, they basically worshipped a pantheon of gods on Mount Olympus, right? Uh, they thought there might be a connection. As a matter of fact, there was a connection, and uh, that gave them perhaps some concern. Now, when the jailer heard the news of their release, he was, he was thankful. Uh, he had been blessed to come to know Jesus through their evangelistic work, and now they would be free to continue that work. He was overjoyed, and so he went to Paul to deliver the message and to encourage them to leave in peace. But when Paul heard, he decided he was going to do something else. Okay, Luke writes, uh, but Paul said to them, he said to the policemen through the jailer, that's the them that are referred to here, they have beaten us in public without trial, men who are Romans, and have thrown us into prison. And now are they sending us away secretly? No, indeed, but let them come themselves and bring us out. Notice the emphasis, let them come themselves and bring us out. Now, Paul knew that they had violated Roman law in the way that they had treated them. Uh, A.T. Robertson, I refer to him uh, periodically. He's that great Greek scholar, had tremendous insight into the, uh, uh, the original language of the New Testament, wrote probably the world's longest uh, Greek grammar. I think we have it in our library. But he writes this, the law of Valeria, which was written in 509 B.C., and the law of Portia, written in 248 B.C., made it a crime to inflict blows on a Roman citizen. Cicero, who is that, that great Roman statesman, that great orator, says this, to fetter a Roman citizen was a crime, to scourge him a scandal, to slay him, parricide. Parricide means it's like killing one of your own family members. Claudius had deprived the city of Rhodes of its freedom for having crucified some citizen of Rome. Now, Paul and Silas were citizens of Rome, and so they were exempt from the kinds of beatings that they had undergone, especially a public one. They weren't even given the chance to defend themselves. Robertson writes, even slaves in, in Roman law had a right to be hurt. Having no trial also meant they had no opportunity to appeal, of course, the, the results of the trial, the verdict. And that, too, was a privilege guaranteed every Roman citizen by law. I mean, let's not forget later in the book of Acts, Paul is going to appeal to, um, to Caesar to overturn what he believes an unjust decision on the part of, um, of Festus. Well, when the policemen returned to the magistrates and they reported to them what Paul had said, they were afraid. They didn't realize that Paul and Silas were Romans, and they also understood that ignorance was no excuse. Now, it's interesting, they didn't challenge their claim, and there's a reason for that, because they knew that to pretend to be a Roman citizen when you're not was actually a capital offense. And not many people would want to risk that, especially over something like a beating. And if they called them out on this and they turned out to be really citizens, it would make their situation worse. So they realized we, we've treated them like criminals without a trial. They had every right to be afraid. Now, Paul wasn't about to let all of this go unaddressed, okay? He told them that they must come to the prison to release them. In essence, what Paul was asking for here was for them to offer a public apology for their mistreatment, that they would vindicate them. And so they came. 
you know, without much leverage. There wasn't really much else they could do. And when they arrived, Luke says that they appealed to them. And I think the idea was they appealed to them not to press charges against them. That it would at the very least mean that they would lose their positions, but at the very most might possibly lose their lives. They also brought them out of the prison, uh, as Paul requested, to show publicly their acquittal. You know, that they were sorry for what they had done. And then they, pay, they begged Paul and Silas to leave the city, that this whole matter might quickly be forgotten, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Now, as we think about this whole situation, we see that Paul wanted this to be addressed. They had broken the law. But the question is, why? Why did Paul do this? Was it because his rights had been violated and because he wanted to restore his reputation? Well, no, I don't think we can assume that that is the case because Paul knew when he began to follow Jesus that this was going to have a serious impact on his reputation. As a matter of fact, he made himself like the Lord Jesus Christ of no reputation, which means he was no longer going to care what other people thought about him. It wasn't because of reputation. Well, was it because of revenge then? Did he just want to get even with them? Well, we know that that's not what he's after because if it was, he wouldn't have listened to them as they appealed to him not to press charges. He would have pressed charges and gotten them into as much trouble as he possibly could. He knew that his Lord, not only from his example, but also through his word, called him not to retaliate. Paul writes in Romans 12, verse 17, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. He knew he was not to seek revenge. He continues in verse 19, Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. He knew his responsibility was to show mercy in the midst of mistreatment, and that God would take care of the rest, which is why he concludes in verse 20 and 21, but if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In other words, don't be overcome with an evil desire to seek vengeance, but overcome their evil by showing them good because God is going to even the score. Don't you do it. He will do it. Now, this may be, because I think the question always comes up when I read this text. I know, why didn't Paul and Silas tell them before they got beaten that they were Roman citizens? Why didn't he tell them while they were in the prison you know, instead of singing hymns, why, why aren't they saying, jailer, listen to me, we're Roman citizens, we've been mistreated. Why did they go through all of this? Well, it may have been because of what we just read. We know that Paul didn't care about his reputation, and we know he wasn't seeking revenge, but there was something he did want. He wanted God to deal with the situation in a way that would bring glory to his name. And this is a form of vengeance, you might say, against these uh, magistrates because, again, they were greatly humiliated and humbled and struck with fear. But it was certainly something God used to advance the gospel. Now, the first thing that the Lord accomplished or what Paul wanted through this and what the Lord actually accomplished was to clear the gospel. Remember, they were in prison for preaching that gospel, for preaching the good news. Their beating and subsequent imprisonment cast aspersion on it and might have served to turn some people away. Now, I'm not going to believe that any kind of message is going to land me in jail. Their public vindication would restore public opinion and open people again to listen to the truth. There was something else at stake as well, and that was the safety of the fledgling church remember, that was just planted in Philippi. The persecution of Paul and Silas uh, suffered, you know, this, you know, they suffered this because of the gospel, and that would make it much more likely for the same thing to happen to the new converts. You know, once you open that door, 
and you treat some of these people this way, you're going to begin to treat all these people this way. So they were wanting to circumvent that. The public humiliation of these magistrates would certainly go a long ways to keep them from doing that, to protect the church and to allow them to continue the work. I believe that throughout the arrest and the beatings and the imprisonment, that Paul and Silas had only one thing on their minds, and that was the kingdom of God. His reputation, okay? The vindication of his gospel, uh, the gathering of his children and the protecting of his children in order that his work might go forward, in order that he might be glorified. See, this wasn't a vindictive maneuver on the part of Paul. He wasn't seeking revenge. He wasn't trying to restore his reputation. He was trying to restore the, the reputation of God and His gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, that's the attitude that the Lord wants us to have as well, to put the kingdom of heaven first above all things so that if we are mistreated in this way, that our concern is not get even, but our concern is God's glory, that I do the right thing so that God may work. And this is what He has given us the power to do through His Holy Spirit. The Lord doesn't say to us, do this, and then I will do this, but He's saying, I've given you the power to do this, and so live as I've called you to live, and let me take care of the things that need to be taken care of. So He calls us to set aside our rights, to set aside our reputation, to set aside our desire for revenge in order that we may seek His glory. Okay, this is a great example of doing just that. That's what they did, and God glorified His name. Now, I want you to notice also that when Paul and Silas did this, not only did the Lord strengthen His kingdom in Philippi, again, protect His church and leave that door open, but He also vindicated them. They, they got public vindication. That wasn't what they were actually seeking for, but it was through that vindication that these other things would be brought about. If we do what is right, if we honor the Lord, He will also vindicate us. And I think we, we see that going on also in our country, don't we, as we see people standing up for their rights when the wicked bring false charges against them and try to persecute them or destroy them because they're not doing something like baking a cake, you know, or whatever it is they might be doing, you know, for something that they just don't believe in, homosexual marriage that the Lord in the end has been vindicating His people. We need to believe that He will do that. Now, there may also be a third reason why Paul called these magistrates to account, and that might be to awaken them to their sins. Because when your life is in danger, you begin to think more seriously about the things that are most important, what you have to face after death, and these magistrates thought that perhaps they were going to die. I imagine they began to think about that as well and began to look outside of themselves and began to look towards God. And I'm not just saying the false gods, but the true God, which everyone knows exists. That's the reason why God does these things. That's the reason why He brings trouble like this on unbelievers, to wake them up to their danger and to get them to start thinking ahead and not just about the moment. So God had a gracious purpose in this as well, to awaken these sinners. And then finally we see this, that Paul and Silas didn't immediately leave the city as the magistrates hoped that they would. After they left the prison, they went back to Lydia's house where the church was meeting. And when they saw the brethren, which would include Timothy and Luke. Remember, they're with the party, but they didn't go into prison with them, likely because they were not that obvious, that, that public. It was Paul and Silas that were doing all the teaching. It would also include Lydia and her household and others who believed. They encouraged them. And I think they encouraged them in probably a couple of different areas. Now, these believers knew what had happened to Paul and Silas. I mean, remember when Peter got, into, uh, got arrested and put in jail? What the church did for him that night? They prayed. I think the church was gathered together in Lydia's house, and, and they were praying. 
And the apostles, of course, wanted them to know that their prayers had been answered. That the Lord had not only done what they had hoped that He would do, which is release them, but He had done far more than that. He made it safer for them now to continue the work of the gospel. Now, let's not forget that this is why the Lord wants us to pray. We have needs. And the Lord stands ready to meet those needs. And He says that He will not only do what we ask of Him, but He will do far more beyond that, far more abundantly beyond all we ask or think. That is, that's true. You know, if that's true, why don't we ask more than we do? You have not because you ask not. Well, they asked and God gave and He gave more than, than they thought, even thought to ask, okay? But I also imagine that they encouraged them to remain faithful because of the Lord's goodness to them. You know, the Lord had been good to them. He had saved these believers from all of their sins and they had a tremendous debt that they could never repay, a debt of love. And so he, they encouraged them just keep on loving the Lord. And because of what the Lord did for us, He was good, good to us. He's released us from prison. And because of His goodness in opening this door, so He encouraged them to remain faithful to what the Lord had called them to and what He had called them to do. Be faithful in their lives to worship and honor and to serve Him. And of course, that's also why we should remain faithful to the Lord because He's also been good to us in, in virtually every way that He was good to them. And that's something that the table reminds us of this morning. I mean, think of the great price that Jesus paid in order to save us from absolute and, you know, uninterrupted suffering, misery, and pain for eternity. And He did it at the cost of His own life, even from a human perspective, being alienated from His, his Father, on the cross, suffering not just the wounds, the physical wounds, but also the spiritual anguish of God's wrath on the cross. He did all of that. We, he's been so good to us. And actually, you know, that hymn that we often sing about not really knowing how much we owe until the day we see what we would have gotten, you know, as uh, Robert Murray McShane says, you know, not till then shall I know how much I owe and so forth. When I see the wicked shrink on the fiery deluge brink, you know, when I see them, well, you know, basically cast into the lake of fire and realize that's what I deserve. Not till then will I know, you know, just, just how much I owe you. So we owe the Lord a great debt, but even thinking about the things that He has done for us in this life, we owe Him such a great debt. He is, takes care of us every single day, gives us every good thing we have, every good uh, gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. So we owe Him a great debt, and that debt that is repaid through acts of love by remaining faithful to Him. And that's what the Lord calls us as well to do this morning, and particularly as we come to the table, because here we renew our resolve, our covenant with the Lord to do what we promised Him we would do when we took up the cross of Christ and began to follow Him. So with, with that in mind, let's bow in just a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to prepare us to come to the table to renew our covenant with Him and to thank Him and praise Him and receive strength to continue to be faithful to Him. Let's pray.